Sometimes that same way everywhere, so yeah. Yeah, and like, oh, the Catholics had, like, what is this? Um, we're, we're talking about Bible right now oh, wait, for those recording. joining us online for sec, uh, second session. Yes, go ahead. What are you saying about so, the Bible? So, there's like the Book of Wisdom, and then over here there is. There, yeah, the, the apocryphal books uh, that are not in the the typical books that are used by everybody else if yeah. you're not Roman Catholic. Yeah. Yes. Um, okay. So it's different. It is, it is different. Yeah. And, and that's not wrong or bad, but actually how Roman Catholics look at the Bible and the authority of the Bible is different than the Lutheran Church. Mm -hmm. Luther said sola scriptura, which means the scripture is our authority. Mm -hmm. The Roman Catholics said scripture and tradition are authority. So the tradition of the church is as important as the scripture is to defining who we are, say, you, who you are as a Roman Catholic, which is why, for instance, the, uh, the Immaculate Conception of Mary is a doctrine within the Catholic Church, even though there is absolutely no scriptural basis for it, but it is a tradition that holds just as much importance as the scripture itself. So I'm not saying that as an indictment. I'm saying that that's the way... So, I will say this, in defense of the Roman Catholic Church, okay. <laughs> Sola Scriptura runs the risk of people coming up with wild and crazy interpretations. Uh, at some point, the, the, our tradition should give us some guidance in how we understand the Scripture. Uh, because people 2,000 years ago, and 1,500 years ago, and 1,000 years ago, also we're struggling with what does the scripture mean? How do we interpret it? They should give us some guidance uh, instead of us just picking up the Bible and saying, oh, it was written to the United States in 2024. That's the problem of what we call so-called evangelical Christianity in the United States. Now I'm careful with that because I'm offended that the word evangelical is used for a small group of Christians who are also politically associated with the right wing. That's wrong. <laughs> Evangelical is anybody who announces the good news of Jesus Christ, and we are not affiliated with a particular political ideology. Political ideologies all fall short of the kingdom of heaven. But our, our, our traditions, this is what happens when our traditions don't have any guiding influence on it. So there's got to be a balance. I think tradition becoming equal to scripture obviously is wrong, but tradition should give us some guidance on how we understand the scriptures because our forefathers and mothers have wrestled with these things before and maybe we should take their advice don't that doesn't mean we have to agree with everything but we should understand that they were wrestling the same things that we are so let's take a look at this today we this is kind of an introductory thing to what we're going to be looking at momentarily we are actually looking at prayer and reading the Bible these are two spiritual disciplines that we as Christians should participate in regularly. Now, I am not the person, yes, I'm not the type of, right, number three, you are correct. Okay, I am not the type of person that believes that you have to pray two hours every single day and pray on your knees. I don't do that. I'm confessing to you as a pastor, I don't, I don't even kneel down for prayers. You want, to, you want to know what I do? Hold on. For those online, let me show you. I'm going to show you what I do for my prayers. <laughs> this is what I do. I can't play today, but I'll just start playing a, a, a picking pattern. And what it does is it now my mind is focused on that picking pattern because I'm distracted by so many things. My brain works all over the place and what the guitar does is it just focuses me just on that music. So now it's just the music. When my brain is finally quiet of all those things, then I'm communing with God. So uh, it works for me, okay? Uh, some people ride their bicycles. I ride my bicycle too. I find that a very, meditative type of thing.
to ride my bike because all of a sudden I'm not thinking about the world. I'm just thinking about that road in front of me. And now all of a sudden it simplifies my mind to be able to focus on God. Running did that for me even better than bicycling because bicycling can be a little bit dangerous. <laughs> and so you have to reserve some of your brain for what stupid cars are doing and how they're texting and not looking for bicyclists. Okay, so I have to be careful of that. Running was just great for that. You may find something else. Um, washing the dishes. What? As crazy as it sounds, <laughs> why? Because washing the dishes is a repetitive behavior you don't have to think about. All of a sudden, everything that you're thinking about drops away, and now your brain is just free of those burdens. Now you're ready to focus on God, right? So, all right, I'm putting this away. <laughs> Prayer is a relationship. Prayer is a discussion between you and God. It's, it can be ritual prayer. So I'm out here to say that there are some Christians who condemn ritualized prayer of the Roman Catholics or even of the Lutheran Church. We do ritualized prayer as well of the Lutheran Church, don't we? Um, Jesus did ritualized prayers. So if you're going to be critical of the church, like the Roman Catholic Church or Lutherans who are doing ritualized prayers, then once again, you've got to get off your high horse. But, I, you know, prayer, the ritualized prayers also bring us into focus. And if you've ever been to a, an Assemblies of God church, they're the ones that are really con condemn ritualized prayer. But if you listen to their prayer, their prayer is ritualized too. They say it in the exact same way every single time. They structure it in the same way every single time. Okay? So, you know, I, I do that. We had some Assemblies of God folks uh, join our church and say, we don't do that liturgy and all that type of stuff. God is good. And then you heard them say, I said that to them, God is good. And they said back, all the time. And then I said, all the time. And they said, God is good. I said, you just participated in a liturgy. This is what Assemblies of God folks do. That's a liturgy. They're like, it is not, it is too. And, but again, if you ever go to a Baptist church, a Assemblies of God church, listen to how the person praying structures the prayer. They use the same phrases every single time to tie together their prayers. There may be certain differences between them, but it's still a ritualized prayer. Formula is okay. Um, so factoid, 99% of the Americans say they pray. Most are formula prayers. Not critical of that. And, but here, prayer said at time of crisis. Oh, good God, I just went 70 past that police officer. Please help me not get a ticket. <laughs> right? But what is prayer? Prayer is a lifeline to God. We develop our relationship with God. And it, there does need to be a personal expression uh, a per, you know, personal expression of prayer as well as a public expression of prayer. It is good to do ritual prayers, but I also think we need more than ritualized prayers. Okay? So through prayer, here's what we develop, a relationship with God. Jesus uses a very specific Aramaic word when he tells us how to pray. He says, when you pray, pray our Father who art in heaven. That's really a bad translation. The Aramaic phrase that Jesus uses for father would be better translation, translated daddy. It is the intimate word that a, parent, that a child uses for their father. You don't go up to your father and say, oh father, can you please help me with my homework? You say, daddy, can you please help me with my homework? That's the type of intimate relationship we have a privilege as Christians having with God. So that expresses our intimate relationship with God. One thing that people do struggle over is the fact that we call God Daddy or Father, that male relationship. And I get it. So I want you to be clear that we don't pray to God as Father because God is a male. 
It represents a relationship that we have, a trusting relationship with the Heavenly Daddy who protects us. It's, it, it is patriarchal imagery in one sense, but make no mistake, God is not a man. I want to tell you a story, Miriam, that you might relate to, just so you know where I stand. We had a good relationship with our Roman Catholic partners up here. And there was a woman in the church up here. Lovely, lovely woman. She said to me one time, she said, I bet you don't understand this idea of Roman Catholics praying to Mary. I said, well, tell me about this. She said, well, listen, for me, I can't call a God dad, father. My father abused me. She went into this, my father sexually abused, and I just can't use that phrase because I don't think that's who God is. And I said, well, you're correct with that. Your God is not your earthly dad. He said, I just can't overcome that language. So she said, I know that my prayers to Mary are really being heard by God. And that's why I pray that way. I said, you know what? God accounts that as faithfulness. So if any of you are sitting me, expecting me to condemn that, I do not. I understand it. Okay? So we should less, be less critical of each other about how we come to God in prayer. That woman is a saintly person, and she is in God's care. All right, so um, we do have this male-dominated language. Sometimes we call God Daddy. We call God the Son also, don't we? Jesus. Well, that's because Jesus had to come as somebody. Male or female. If Jesus had come as a female, I think he would have been dead before. <laughs> before you didn't have the opportunity. She had the opportunity for the ministry to begin, right? So God came as the son. But that doesn't mean, again, that God is male. So let's not get stuck with that. But in this time, women were nothing. They were nothing. But Jesus came and reclaimed women through his relationship with Mary Magdalene, whom he called... Uh, Mary Magdala, which means Mary the Fortress. Okay? That's what that word Mary means. So we have no right, but what we do know is we have no right, based upon our own goodness, to have access to God. But the reason why we can come to God in prayer is through what Jesus the Son does, which is why that is a part of our prayer life too. But we also call God, so we call God Daddy, we call God the Son, we call God the Heavenly, the Holy Spirit. That is actually a neuter term. It's, it's a, a feminine language. Again, it doesn't mean that the spirit is a female, but it just it kind of balances that out a little bit, doesn't it? It lets us know, however, that, the God is, that God is here to be with us. That's who the spirit is. When we talk about God in our hearts, we are talking about the Holy Spirit being with us, that portion of God. God, for Christians, is known by these three names, Father, Son, and Spirit. Not three gods, one God, uh, three different beings in the sense that there's three distinct roles that these beings play, but it's one God. We just don't understand all of that, but it is one God, Father, Son, and Spirit, okay? So when we pray, we understand that God already knows what we're going to pray for, because God knows our heart. So why do we pray? Because prayer is not about asking God for this and that. Not, it's not about asking God for a Mercedes Benz or a million dollars. That's not what prayer is. Prayer is, in the Bible, thanks, praise, adoration, listening, confessing, and asking. Okay? All of those things. We can ask God for anything. But prayer is also just sitting sometimes and listening. The best prayers I've ever had are when I sit there in just silence that meditation time, and I'm listening for God, okay? Prayer does change things. When you pray for something, remember how we said last week in our prayers when we we're confessing our sins, and uh, we we're confessing when we're praying for enemies, we pray for God to do what for them? Change, bless them, and change our attitude towards them. So you better believe when you go to God in prayer, God says, change us. God also changes our circumstances. And most importantly, our relationship with God deepens whenever we pray. So prayers sometimes seem to go unanswered. 
Sometimes because we have a sinful attitude, we talked about sin last week, that creates a barrier between us and God that needs to be confessed. God hears our prayer even though we're sinful. But sin prevents me from praying rightly. Because now I'm praying for a Mercedes Benz. And I'm praying for God to get people. That's sin. When I'm praying in sin, God is, God is refusing to answer those prayers. When I pray for God to strike somebody dead, God doesn't hear that prayer. God is not going to respond to that prayer. That puts a barrier between me and God. Okay? Our motivation is often wrong. Okay? When we pray to God. Uh, we ask, because we ask wrongly, to get things that serve our materialistic pleasures. All right? That's not what we're praying for. I mean, can you imagine if your child only asked you for money every single time they came to you? At some point you'd say, look, this is not a relationship. I love you, but I'm just not giving you everything you asked me for. Okay? Sometimes God doesn't respond to our prayers because it's not good for us. Now, it's hard to imagine we're praying for somebody to be healed of cancer. Why aren't they healed of cancer? I can't answer that question. I'm not going to. I don't know why people are not healed of cancer. But I do know sometimes we pray to receive something that God is like, uh, I'm going to put barriers in your way so you don't receive it because you don't know what you're asking for. Right? It might not be good for you. Or the timing might be off of it. It's good for you, but 10 years down the road. Have you ever had prayed those prayers and you don't get it the first time or the second time around, all of a sudden things open up? Maybe because you're ready for it now. All right? But I will say this, number five. Those prayers made within the will of God are always answered. Always. Not always the way we want them to be, but God always listens to our prayers and answers them. So, you know, I'm just asking you as a part of your daily life to set aside a time, two or three minutes, five minutes, ten minutes, that are just dedicated to just you and God. Or little vignettes during the day. Okay, God, I got a 30-second break. This is going to sound silly. You got to go to the bathroom. I don't mean to be gross about this, but you're going. why can't that be a time of just solitude for a minute? Okay, God, I'm just taking this, uh, taking a quick breath. I'm here in the silence of this restroom. Thank you for being with me today. Continue to be with me this day. Help me to use this opportunity in front of me for blessing this person I'm going to see. That's a good prayer, right? Imagine starting every day with that prayer. Okay, God, and this is all your prayer is. God, I got a tough day today. Give me the strength. Let me respond in a godly manner to those with whom I interact. And if I don't, show that to me so that I can reconcile my relationship with them. Give me courage this day. Amen. If you prayed that day, prayer every day, fantastic. Every time you sat down to a meal, you said, God, thank you for that which gave its life so that I might live. That's our prayer when we sit down. Because something died for us. I'm going to confess, I'm a medium. Okay? I am not a vegetarian. I, something was killed so I might live. We better be grateful for that. That was one of God's creatures. Um, all right? So that's what we have to be consistent. Don't be overly optimistic. Be comfortable with times of silence and connect it with your Bible readings. Okay? I don't want to spend too much more time with this because we do need to get to the Bible readings. But the Lord's Prayer is given to us as an example of how we ought to pray. Okay? And the things contained in the prayer are not things that we have to include in every prayer, but are those types of things that we as Christians pray for. For forgiveness, for help in forgiving others, for the things that are necessary for life, not our Maserati, but for the daily bread that we need. For God to bless our neighbors. All of those things are contained in the Lord's Prayer. And that's what makes the Lord's Prayer a good example prayer uh, for us. Okay, so that's prayer time. We Lutheran Christians often, we do use the Lord's Prayer every Sunday. 
but as a sample of how to teach people how to pray. That's something that connects us to Roman Catholics. Roman Catholics do as well too, except they don't pray the, the, the benediction at the end, right? That's the one difference. And that's okay, because there are actually two forms of a Lord's Prayer in the Bible. One with it, and one without it. There's not a right or wrong way to do it, okay? Any questions about prayer? Prayer is, um, I hope we answered some of those questions you might have. Prayer is obviously a part of our worship service, but we do encourage people to make prayer a part of their life. Okay, reading the Bible. So we have these two things that I think go together, prayer and reading the Bible. This is how we hear God. And this isn't something that should be done for you by your pastor, okay? We do listen to the gospel lesson and to the lessons in Sunday church, but you need to make Bible study and prayer a part of your daily life and it's not your pastor doing it for you, okay? We can't be passive about this. We need to hear from God, and the way we hear from God is through prayer and through reading the Bible. When I do uh, counseling with couples about to be married, and we're teaching about God's will for them as a couple, I say, how do you know God's will for you? I don't know. Well, there's multiple ways we can know God's will for us. Prayer and Bible study. And then lastly, interacting with brothers and sisters in Christ who can guide us and direct us and love us. We'll get to that last one. But it said, if you want to know the will for your relationship, it's by praying together. It's by reading the Bible together, even if it's for a minute a day. You take, hold on, let me show you guys something. I didn't play. All right, here we go. I'm back again. We have these books called Christ in Our Home that are devotional booklets. If you as a couple say, make a commitment to reading this every day for, it takes two minutes before a meal, before you go to bed, whatever the case might be. Yeah, you know, I used to be very derisive, very judgmental. I said, oh, you know, it's just Christian popcorn. You're just not a lot of nourishment to it. You know what? There is a lot of nourishment to it. I was wrong with that, and it was wrong to be so indicting of these. Because if you participate in this, you're inviting God into your relationship. You're inviting God into your life. At least it's a ritual every single day where God is a part of your life. So I really encourage uh, the use of these types of programs. I think it's fantastic. Hey, kids. All right, I'm trying. I'm finishing. I'm finishing. I know everybody's here for worship. But i got to get to the Bible, people. All right, so we're halfway done with this. We'll give me another 10 minutes, people, that are here for worship. All right, so prayer and reading the Bible are the two, two of the ways that we personally can connect with God in our relationship with God. So um, I don't want to read all the Bible lessons with this, but you notice session four about Bible study. Jesus himself, in confronting Satan, uses the word of God against Satan. It is our defense in our time of need. It what gives us what God is trying to speak to us. So let me tell you in shorthand what the Bible is. God speaks a word. His faithful servants want to communicate what we believe God is trying to tell us. The witnesses to the events that God has done wrote what they believe God did and their understanding of that and pass it on to us. That is what the Bible is. That means that God is directly trying to communicate to us through these human-made words. They're still human-made words, okay? But make no mistake, God is trying to tell us something through the Word. He works through the Bible. He speaks through the Bible. That is what makes the Bible different than any other book. We do believe that God prospered that and guided the writing of the books. So um, that's why we believe that God is speaking to us through the Bible. So what is the Bible? The Bible is God's Word. God is speaking to us. Remember, when God created the world, how did God create the world? By pulling out an erector set? <laughs> no. What did God do? He talked. We got a speaking God, a talking God. Talking, 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 talking. And when God says a word, 
things happen, right? Let there be light. Bam! Jesus said, God said, let there be love and forgiveness. Jesus was born. Do you see how God's word works? That's what God's word is. The word from God is not only the power of God, it is a part of God. It is part of who God is. So this is a very ancient idea. If a king wanted a road to be built, he would say, I want a road built from this city to this city. And a road would be built in the king's name from that city to that city. His word was powerful. People would go about and build that road. And guess what? That road would now be named after that king. He didn't lift his hands. He spoke a word. But in this case, the God of the Bible is more powerful. He speaks a word and the molecules of the universe are obedient. Inanimate objects obey this God. That's amazing. So who wrote the Bible? Well, I'm going to tell you two seemingly contradictory things. That both are true. It is 100%, the Bible is 100% the work of human beings. It is 100% inspired by God. The Bible is the meaning of the human and the divine. To be inspired by God means that it is God breathed. God breathes into the Bible so that we hear God. Now there's still that human element there. It is written in limited human words through limited human stories and limited human ways of communicating with each other. Some of the language is in poetry. You don't read poetry in the same way that you would anything else, right? Genesis 1, for instance, is written in poetry, which is why we know that Genesis 1 is not meant to be a scientific textbook about how the world was created. It's poetry. There's a lot of evidence that it's poetry by how it structures the six days. Most people are not aware of this by looking at this, but Hebrew poetry is a balanced style of writing where it has one response and another response that fleshes that out. It's a back and forth type of poetry. Genesis 1 is that back and forth thing. We see the, third, the first day of creation, which is balanced by the fourth day of creation. So the first day of creation creates something. The fourth day of creation puts living beings in that environment created on the first day. The second day creates something materialistic. The fifth day puts something uh, living in that condition created on the second day. The third day, God creates something materialistic. The sixth day, God creates a living creature that fits into the thing created on the third day. That's Hebrew poetry. That's how Hebrew poetry is structured. And you know it also by other evidence about how it structures it. It is not meant to be a, a statement of materialistic creation. But it's still God speaking to us about who God is and how he wants to relate to us. So that's what the Bible is. Some passages in the Bible are very difficult to understand, right? It takes a seminary degree, and even then you can't understand them. Because remember one thing, what language is the Bible written in? Three different languages. Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. Okay? And the people who wrote the Greek New Testament... Greek was their second language. They spoke Aramaic. They didn't. Greek was. So, so imagine that. Pig Latin. Yes! We get that with Biblical Greek. I know classical Greek. Koine Greek is what we call New Testament Greek. It is a different animal because sometimes you understand. You, you, when you're reading it, you're like. Do these folks even understand the word that they just said? <laughs> okay? Yeah, it's kind of like pig Latin Greek. And it's kind of true. They, they use Greek differently than traditional Greek because, again, Greek is their second language. So you have to give them some break for that. 
but also understand that we got to be a little less adamant. Well, the Bible says, well, wait a minute. The human wrote it this way. How was God trying to speak through this? These humans sometimes made mistakes. <gasps> what? <laughs> In the book of Matthew, Calvin noticed, oh, I can't remember the, the reference to this right now. I, I wish I did. wish I had it. Calvin observed in his commentary, Matthew quotes from a prophet. Matthew was wrong, Calvin says. That's not the prophet that spoke those words. It was another prophet that spoke those words. Matthew was wrong. So he notices right away that there's a mistake in one of the authors of the Bible. I'm okay with an author making a mistake like that of reference. It happens. It's human. But God is still speaking, and the message is still communicating. So there are mistakes in translation. When we take it from Greek to English, don't believe every translation of the Bible. King James is not completely accurate, folks. In fact, they were dealing with an inaccurate Greek text. But you can still hear God speaking through the King James. It's a very wonderful version. There Inaccuracies in translation. There's an accuracy in interpretation. And I will tell you, every translation of the Bible is an interpretation. There's no such thing as a one-to-one -one correlation between a Greek word and an English word. If you Do you know any other languages? Okay, you know when you're learning a language, what do you do? You learn uh, parallel words in English that relate to that German word or that Greek word. But you, know, those are, you notice that there's sometimes ten different words that you have to learn because that word is used differently. I am hungry. Well, let, let me, I yeah. have hunger, so it's different. It's it is. English. Well, let me use a good word. Bank. B A. I know it. I know it all. Bank. I'm almost done. Bank. What's what? Uh, go to the bank. What did I just say? Go to the river. Or did I say go to the place where you get your money? We use words differently. It's true in the Bible too. Okay. But the Bible is never outmoded, okay? But we cannot accommodate the Bible to our culture. We should read the Bible, and it should, the one thing we need to look at is the bigger picture. And I'm going to give you a hint. What's the bigger picture? God so loved the world that he was willing to die for us rather than live without us. If anything that you're understanding the Bible say takes you astray from that, you need to rethink what you're hearing in the Bible, okay? But you need to read it. When you read it, it will give you fruit, strength, and help you prosper and develop in your relationship with God. Okay, I know, I'm done. My wife is yelling at me. It's okay. I'm sorry, she's not yelling at me. She's just pointing out the facts. I'm sorry if I hurt you. Thank you. She's correct. She's thanking you, not me. She's bored too. She wants to go home. All right, let's pray. Holy Father, we thank you for this lesson for today and pray that you bless us with it. Strengthen us with it. Help us to use the Bible, the reading of the Word and also prayers in our devotional life that we might be strengthened in our service of you and one of In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Get out of your place. Bye. I gotta I gotta pay attention. Hey, thank you everybody for joining us at home too. Bye. <laughs>